everyone. So I knew yesterday when Dr. Melcher asked me to introduce him, I would have no simple task on my hands. I figured I could do all of the normal stuff, mentioned that he got his undergraduate degree in geography and political science at the University of Wisconsin, or that he studied political science and got his PhD at the University of Minnesota, just one of their many distinguished alums. Mm -hmm. um, he's one, one's office is right next door to me, as a matter of fact. It's really quite the um, deal. Could mention that he's taught at UMF since 1999, teaching most of our American government and politics classes, including civil liberties and constitutional law, some classes I've truly loved. He's UMF's pre-law advisor, having placed UMF alum in law, off law programs and jobs all across the country. Um, but then I figured that there's the stuff you don't always get to hear when someone's getting introduced. Um, Professor Melcher is one of the most dedicated people I've ever met. He's dedicated to his students. He gives them tough love and all the support that they need. I got the opportunity to work very closely with him last year through the Maine Public Policy Scholars Program. And I was able to send in late night drafts and get his feedback as soon as he was able to. I was able to be introduced to a network of close friends and colleagues that had nothing but wonderful stuff to say about him. Um, speaking of one of those close friends and colleagues who I may or may not have stolen this job from today, he asked me to uphold a couple of traditions. I've meant to be wearing a tie today, so just picture that. And then he also <laughs> asked me to uh, make some sort of joke about Wisconsin. The one he suggested is, why- Who suggested this <laughs> Why? I have some suspects. <laughs> Go ahead. So why don't they sell Kool-Aid in Wisconsin? Does anybody know? <laughs> it's because people from Wisconsin can't figure out how to get four quarts of water into those little paved pouches. <laughs> but that joke aside, we all know the real comedian here is Dr. Melcher. His uh, puns and word plays and accents can make a dense lecture fly by and seem like it took no time at all. In fact, some of them are so popular that the, the veterans of Dr. Melcher classes in the room could repeat the ending back to <laughs> both historians. Um, but all that aside, he is a great professor and I feel lucky to have been able to be educated by him. So without further ado, the man who really doesn't need an introduction, Dr. Melcher. Thank you, Allison. Um, there's been a lot of speculation recently in the news about who was responsible for the famous anonymous memo that had been written by an insider in the Trump administration. I think I might be a wily enough detective to figure out who might have leaked some of those joke ideas uh, to you, but I can't reveal that because there might be media present. <clears throat> O'Brien. Oh, anyway, um, thank, thank you, Allison. Allison's one of our uh, wonderful pre-law students. I'm happy to talk to any students about law school. Uh, Michael Shepner is helping handle our new 3-3 arrangement with the University of Maine, and he'd be happy to speak to you as well. Uh, later this semester, we are expecting Caroline Wilshusen of the University of Maine uh, School of Law, their admissions director will be coming. We're expecting uh, UNH Law to send a representative here uh, as well. And you can follow those things on Pre-Law's Facebook page, Lexus Castor Farmingtonius, Farmington Beaver Law, which is a closed group. Not about riparian rights or dams, it's about UMF. This is the 12th time I have done this. Time, time flies. Um, the legal process moves slowly and, you know, I move slowly as well. And so I'm going to talk today about five cases from the upcoming term of the Supreme Court, which are Weyerhaeuser Company, and if you can spell Weyerhaeuser without looking it up, um, you need to buy a vowel to be able to spell Weyerhaeuser. A, E, and U do not follow together generally, versus the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now, I will admit that I picked apple versus pepper in large part because I was amused at the idea of some kind of veggie tales type conflict. Comparing apples and peppers seems so much more innovative than comparing apples and oranges. The puns are only getting started. 
In the case of awful jokes, the emergency exits are located on either side of the lecture room. This is about Apple Incorporated, the computer company, and its app store, and whether or not its app store constitutes an illegal monopoly under the Clayton Act. This case will only issue, solve the issue of standing. Tim's versus Indiana is an Eighth Amendment case. My students all know the Eighth Amendment. I always let my students go early the first day of class because I have believed since I was an undergraduate that to make any student stay the full length in a 100 minute class the first day is cruel and unusual punishment. This is a different piece of the Eighth Amendment that we don't see nearly as much. It's one of the very few parts of the Bill of Rights that has never been formally incorporated into the states. And that's the piece of the Eighth Amendment that talks about excessive fines. Uh, we all know about the cruel and unusual punishment, but it also forbids excessive fines. And Mr. Timms believes that the state of Indiana acted illegally uh, in taking, um, taking something from him. And then um, a very sad case that I'm going to avoid joking about, Madison versus Alabama, uh, is a death penalty case my con law students looked at uh, last semester. And then Gamble versus United States. And then speaking of gambling, uh, the first case I'll talk about from last term is the sports gambling case. Biggest case affecting sports gambling in American history. Was known as Christie. Chris Christie is no longer governor. He's driven over the George Washington Bridge. They finally opened it up for him and moved on through. Uh, versus the NCAA. This was a lawsuit by the state of New Jersey against the NCAA and the four major professional sports leagues in the United States. Carpenter versus United States, the masterpiece cake shop ruling, which I think almost every one of you in the room uh, had been following this case uh, about, um, well, about private business owners' free speech rights versus LGBT rights versus federal versus state. This cake has many layers to it, and I'll try and put some frosting. Uh-oh. All right. I warn you, the jokes won't get any better. Leave now. And uh, uh, Janice versus Ask Me Council 31, uh, those of us uh, who are in uh, the teachers union here at UMF certainly paid a lot of attention to this. This was a major loss for public employee unions, probably the harshest ruling for public employee unions in American history, overturned a 41-year-old precedent from Detroit, which we will talk about. And I'll end up with South Dakota versus Wayfair, a uh, case about sales taxes. So as time rolls on, people leave the Supreme Court. So first I want to talk about the retirement of Justice Anthony Kennedy. This could lead to some very big changes on the court. And that picture there shows you how much power Supreme Court justices have over time. He was put on the Supreme Court by a president many of you do not remember firsthand. A man named Ronald Reagan was his third try at appointing a court justice. Tried to appoint Robert Bork, a brilliant conservative uh, intellectual, maybe the top conservative constitutional law intellectual in the country, who also had some very controversial views that there was no such thing as a right to privacy. Uh, many African American and civil rights organizations opposed him. And Bork was voted down by the United States Senate, which is very, very unusual. The next guy Reagan tried was a man named Douglas Ginsburg, no relation to the notorious RBG, and he got in a little bit of trouble. Now, I'm seeing uh, some of my friends in the back who went to school in Massachusetts, and, or went to, uh, came from Massachusetts. I'm sure no one would ever think about smoking marijuana in school in Massachusetts. Well, unfortunately, Doug Ginsburg decided that he would do that while teaching at Harvard with his students. And you know, the Democrats on the Hill, pretty mellow about that, you know, so like, what's the big deal, dude? Uh, Strom Thurmond and some of the other conservative Republicans, not pleased at the thought of a Supreme Court justice admitting to violating the law with people he was training in law. So he went away, and on the third try, he nominates Anthony Kennedy, uh, one of the few Californians to serve on the Supreme Court, uh, and that's him with Donald Trump uh, last year. Uh, so he's been there a long time, 
And there's a lot of liberals who are really cranky that he's retiring. How dare he retire? He's going to screw up all this stuff. But he's been on since 1988. He's retiring just shy of his 82nd birthday. Most people do get to retire once they hit their 80s. You know, depending on how expensive gasoline gets, I might still be doing these when I'm 85. But at least for now, you usually expect they can. And he has a reputation as the most common swing vote. Uh, that he is often between four fairly conservative justices and four fairly liberal uh, justices. And he has a reputation as being slightly liberal, which I would argue is somewhat overblown and looks too much at his gay rights rulings. Every major case involving LGBT rights in the last 25 years had Kennedy as the author of the opinion, going back to the Colorado case, uh, going back to uh, Texas's laws against sodomy being struck down, to the tax case, uh, to uh, the most recent case, Obergefell versus Hodges. Kennedy is the opinion writer in all of those and tended to take a line very friendly to LGBT rights. Many believe this is because he has many LGBT friends, but he is not a blanket liberal. Reagan got what he wanted in somebody who generally rules in favor of business, generally rules in favor of states on federalism. This is not Thurgood Marshall or Ruth Bader Ginsburg retiring from the court. It's really mostly on those social issue questions uh, where he's tended to be more liberal. Uh, Kennedy famously supported Citizens United, for example, uh, which is an extremely controversial opinion. Well, this may or may not be the next Supreme Court justice. And for those of you out in YouTube land watching this, you're all giggling watching this three weeks later, like, oh, we all knew it happened. I am not a prophet. I barely make a profit. I, I don't know what's going to happen in all of this. We've had a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of issues. Uh, Kavanaugh was a clerk for, rank, uh, for um, Anthony Kennedy. There are people who suggest that Kennedy may have met with President Trump and suggested him. There are even people who have said Kennedy might have resigned on the condition that his former law clerk, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, be, uh, be appointed. He's been called the Forrest Gump of American politics, not because he runs well or because he doesn't seem very bright, but he has been everywhere. He just pop Remember how in Forrest Gump, Forrest seemed to like pop up at playing ping pong with China and popping up at the Vietnam War demonstrations and the rest of it. So what's he done? Well, he helped draft Ken Starr's report on Bill Clinton's misbehavior during his time in office. Uh, he later worked in George W. Bush's White House, which is why during the confirmation hearings, you have seen his good friend Condoleezza Rice immediately behind him. Uh, he helped work on uh, the Republican side in the Florida case of the recount in 2000. Uh, he was hired by none other than Elena Kagan, one of the reliable liberals on the Supreme Court, hired him to come in as an adjunct teacher when she was dean of the law school at Harvard. There is no place this guy hasn't been other than in any elective office. And the issue that has come up is allegations of sexual misconduct by the woman in the middle, a woman named Christine Margaret Blasey. She is now, or Christine Blasey Ford. She was a student at a nearby school. Um, Kavanaugh had gone to uh, prep school, Georgetown Prep, uh, where also Judge Gorsuch went, who's now on the Supreme Court. Uh, they were about two years apart in the same school. And she has alleged that Kavanaugh and a friend of hers, a friend of his, were drunk and attempt, attempted to assault her. They claim she was pinned down on the bed. Kavanaugh has denied all of the allegations, though I have heard lately, he has said some of this might have been horseplay that was misinterpreted. Uh, her name only came out very recently. She had told several members, or two of her members of Congress from California about the incident. She didn't want to put her name out there. Essentially, she was outed, that other people leaked her name, and she eventually came out and said, yes, this is me uh, they're talking about. She's now a college professor. Uh, in California. The latest news on her is uh, many of the people on the Judiciary Committee want her to testify. She has said she will only testify after the FBI completes an investigation. And as we've seen from various FBI investigations, that could be a while. 
So it's like those old Snickers commercials, not going any place for a while. This may not go any place uh, for a, a while. Uh, Senator Collins, if you, put, if you have watched any television, especially any local news, you may be aware that Susan Collins is a vote various people are trying to influence on all sides of the question. Uh, Planned Parenthood has put money in, very effective advertisement, the one, woman from uh, Topsom who had an abortion when she was younger, their ads saying what a great person Kavanaugh is, how much people like him, although they might want to pull the tagline, the more people hear about Judge Kavanaugh, the more they like him. That hasn't seemed to really be quite true over the last week or so. Uh, but Collins is a key vote, and Maine, as always, is a cheap media by state. Costs a lot less to advertise on TV here than it's going to uh, in some other places. And she's generally regarded, uh, along with Lisa Murkowski, the Republican from Alaska, as one of the key votes on this question. So we don't know what's going to happen. And before I dive into the regular cases, I just want to give a quick uh, read on three cases I talked about last year. DC versus Westby, you may recall as the case of the mysterious lady Peaches who invited people over to a house she was not supposed to invite people over to. And they proceeded to have the kind of party that people call the police on with gambling, strippers, all sorts of things, you know, basically your everyday dorm. No, they wouldn't do such things. You couldn't afford those things here at Farmington. And there had been question about whether the police should be allowed to be sued in this, whether they had reasonable action. Nine nothing ruling written by Justice Thomas on the side of the police that said the police acted reasonably. And because they acted reasonably, we don't even need to deal with the question. They were also looking at this case just called qualified immunity which is to say if police are doing their job properly, you can't sue them for the proper execution uh, of their job. Gill versus Whitford was supposed to be the biggest reapportionment and gerrymandering case of all time. Uh, concerned some alleged gerrymanders in Wisconsin. The Supreme Court basically punted this back down to lower levels. They did say the arguments the Democrats were using weren't good enough. They said, the Democrats are arguing, well, we got 52% uh, of the vote, but only 30% of the seats. That's proof we got cheated. And what wound up happening was the Supreme Court said, that's not good enough to prove a constitutional violation. So what's going to happen is Wisconsin's going to have the same districts it has had, which are very favorable to the Republican Party, and somebody else is going to sue about this. It won't go away. Lots of you know about procrastination. Do, waiting to do things until the last second. This is basically how the Supreme Court does it. Uh, we're not ready. Uh, we'll do that some other time. Donald Trump doesn't procrastinate. He gets right to the point of the things he wants to do. And one of the things he wanted to do, as he said he would do in the campaign, was that he wanted a travel ban, which he initially said in the campaign was aimed at Muslim nations. After Rudy Giuliani told him, you know, you need a little better justification than that, said, well, no, it's an anti-terror thing, and I'm going to throw in two other countries that don't have a high Muslim population, Mali and Venezuela, and said, well, they're not cooperating on terrorism. We're going to ban their people, too. State of Hawaii sued against this, saying, we have numerous students ready to enroll at the University of Hawaii. And they don't know if they can come because right now they're being subjected to a travel ban. And as such, they had legal standing to sue. Not surprisingly, Trump won this case. It's very hard to limit presidential power about control of the borders. Uh, in this kind of case, all the case law leading up to this suggested Trump would win. I think if you look at his original intent and the things that he said originally, I think he's clear that he was trying to uh, enact a Muslim travel ban, uh, but the court didn't see it that way and allowed that to go forward. So we won't get into DC versus Westby in any more detail, but we'll start with the coming attractions and we're gonna start, ah, it's out of control. Oh, oh, okay, hang on, hang on. Small technical issues, please stand by. Okay, coming attractions. Warehouser Company versus US Fish and Wildlife Service. And if you might, as you might have guessed, this is an environmental case. 
involving this little feller down here who obviously has learned through years of the evolutionary process how to camouflage himself. They're really hard to find. They are also really hard to find because there are only about 200 of them left in the wild and they only live in three tiny swampy areas in Mississippi. It is a type of frog called the dusky gopher frog. The famous, the legendary, the dusky gopher frog. Now, if some of, you, some of the older folks in here, not pointing any fingers, uh, but some of you who have been around a while may remember a similar controversy in the 1970s on the Teleco Dam over a salamander called the snail darter. Similar kind of issue. That a lot of where the Endangered Species Act kicks in is to say critical habitat for rare animals facing extinction needs to be aggressively protected. Uh, this frog formerly was known as the Mississippi gopher frog. I know that sounds like, like one of those jokes as a kid, like what happens when you mix this animal with another one? I don't want to know what happens when you mix an actual gopher with a frog. The reason it's called a gopher frog is because it can only live in the former dens of gopher tortoises. It cannot live any place else, and it needs to breed in what we know in Maine as vernal pools, places that are temporarily filled with water. We all know those places in rural Maine that have water during the spring, don't have it later. They're the only place they can breed because if the water's there long enough for fish to get there, the fish will have dusky gopher snack pate, and they can't survive. They then need to go uphill, find gopher tortoise holes and then use that as their place to live. Did I mention they also need broadleaf pine habitat which has significant sunlight? You can see where there are only three places on the planet these things live which gets us to a tricky case. So Fish and Wildlife administers the Endangered Species Act and that man down in the lower right hand corner is a man named Edward Poitevin. Poitevin's family has owned a particular parcel in eastern Louisiana since about 1870. And they say, and this is very important to us, we feel very tied to this. And they have leased Timberland to Weyerhaeuser and another company since the 1990s. That's where Weyerhaeuser uh, comes into this question. Yeah, I had to have a pun. So, a lot of conservative groups, property rights groups, see this as a large leap of faith to try and reestablish this particular frog, which they want to do on 1,500 acres in a place called Unit One, which sounds like some sort of dystopian science fiction novel. All political prisoners report immediately to Unit One. Unit One is the one place that they think they can extend the life of this particular frog. The conservative groups that do not like what Fish and Wildlife is doing call him a phantom frog. The frog has not only doesn't live there, is not using this as habitat, but has not been anywhere in Louisiana since 1967. So it's been over 50 years since anybody has seen this frog, but they used to have a much, much broader range, as we see about a lot of animals whose range has been narrowed. There used to be caribou in northern Maine. They aren't here anymore. They've been extirpated from those parts of their range. And because it needs such specific habitat, experts pressured fish and wildlife to protect them more aggressively. They said, you could just have one drought in the small area of Mississippi and they're going to be wiped out. Or one natural disaster or one forest fire. You've got to find some other place to keep them alive because just letting them be in this part of Mississippi isn't going to work. And they said, Mr. Point Heaven's land is the perfect place. There's five of these ponds. There's no other place anywhere that's got this combination of stuff. We want them in multiple ponds. They're going to not be as interbred that way. And all they need to do is cut down a bunch of trees, which Mr. Point Heaven doesn't want to do. And so once the clearing is done for them. Couple things about this case. First off, there's the question of the Commerce Clause in this case. Now, my veteran students know that I have a rather deep fondness for the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful Commerce Clause. There are a lot of conservatives who say the government doesn't have the right to do this under the Commerce Clause, particularly to extend this to places where the frogs don't live. They're saying that, that the Endangered Species Act, which specifically says Critical habitat doesn't have to be just where they're living now. 
So their beef is with the law. Their beef is with the law that says to do this. They say this goes way too far. But there's a much bigger issue in here, because the frogs are really kind of small. The big issue is something called Chevron deference. So if you're a private and you see a corporal, you're supposed to salute them because they've got more of a. Chevron deference comes from an important court case called Chevron versus National uh, Resources Defense Council in the 1980s. And Chevron deference is important in any case like this where the government is carrying out law. And what Chevron deference says is the first thing you do in interpreting statutes is to look and see what did Congress say about this. And if it's not clear what Congress said about it, then you go to the administrative agency that carries out the law. That unless their interpretation is arbitrary and capricious, so that's the big word in this case, is this arbitrary, which is fancy lawyer talk for not fair, is it, unless it's arbitrary and capricious, whatever the bureaucracy says holds. Now, if you're a property rights conservative, you don't like the idea of Chevron deference. Uh, the uh, various conservative blogs have been arguing vehemently against Chevron deference for years. Uh, that's Judge Gorsuch down there on the lower right. And he made his name as a leading opponent of Chevron deference. That this is a case that could take Chevron deference out of the ballpark, which would greatly weaken the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and that's something that a number of these groups want. So it's not just about protection of a frog. This case could theoretically rework how any federal regulations are applied in practice. So it's a big deal. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? Well, if he collects on this lawsuit, you would like to be a pepper because this is what is called a, uh, this is a, this is a uh, class action suit. And it concerns Apple's iOS app store. Apple, if you own an Apple device, you own an Apple iPhone or you've got one of their tablets, you know the only place, unless you jailbreak your phone, is from Apple. And that's called in that business a walled garden. You know, it has lovely things growing, but only the things that Apple wants to plant there. Because the only things Apple will sell there are things they specifically approve and they collect a 30% commission on. So, some people say, well, that's a monopoly. You're making these apps more expensive than they ought to be. And you might say, well, what are most of, the, most of the apps aren't that expensive. But when you add this up, this means hundreds of millions of dollars to Apple and similar businesses that use walled garden models every year. So, Mr. Pepper said, we don't have any other place that we can buy these apps. Apple says that's not a problem. If you don't like our monopoly, get something that runs on Android. Buy a different company. You don't have to buy an Apple tablet. Buy a Samsung tablet. Buy uh, Amazon Fire. We're not really a monopoly. So Mr. Pepper and three others joined and sued Apple in 2011. And this case revolves around the question of are they direct or indirect customers? Possibly the dullest part of today's talks. If you can stay awake through this, you can make it all the way uh, through to the end. The question is depicted right here. Does Pepper have standing? See, that's a standing Pepper. Standing and legal issues is the question, does somebody have a right to be there to sue? You can't just say, I'm going to sue President Trump. I don't like the color his hair is today. Well, is that harming you in any way? Well, it's distracting. Well, no, you're going to have to do better than that to have standing in a court case. You can't just, well, I don't like how Iowa does things. Anything. I think yellow and black are ugly colors, and the Badgers are going to do horrible, horrible things to the Hawkeyes this Saturday <clears throat> in Iowa City. And we, of course, know what Iowa stands for. But at any rate, so Apple says Pepper and his particular pans picked a problematic plan that the people are not paying the commission. This legal precedent in a case like this goes back to some cases I'll talk about in a minute. But Apple says, you don't have a case. You can't sue us. The only people who can sue us are the people paying us the commission to advertise. You, as members of the public, you have no right to mess with us whatsoever. So who can sue? Probably not you. If this case follows precedent, Apple is going to win this case, and the Trump administration's lawyers are arguing on behalf of Apple. And part of why is because of the brick and the shoe. 
It sounds like some sort of, you know, parable, you know. This is the parable of the brick and the shoe, and they tried to cross the river. It's about precedence about two companies, one called Hanover Shoe from the 1960s, and particularly a case uh, from the 1980s called the Illinois Brick Case that established what's called the Illinois Brick Doctrine. This is, of course, when the University of Illinois is playing Wisconsin. They miss a lot of shots, and those, of course, become known as Illinois Bricks. No. Illinois Brick was, well, both of these were about whether somebody is a direct seller of products. In Hanover Shoes' case, they were mad at a company making shoe machines. They said, you guys have conspired to jack up the prices. But Hanover Shoe lost on the grounds that they weren't buying them directly. They were buying them through an intermediary. You can't collect pass-on damages. Their argument was, we pay way too high a price because you charge our supplier of these machines too high a price. Supreme Court said, uh-uh, shoe company can't sue them. Very similar ruling is the one that holds now, and it's about Illinois Brick. Illinois Brick was accused of conspiring with nine other brick companies in Illinois in the 1970s to jack up prices on government contracts, which they basically admitted as I understand it, they were doing. And the state of Illinois then tried to sue Illinois Brick. But the Supreme Court said, you can't sue Illinois Brick because you didn't buy the bricks from Illinois Brick. Illinois Brick sold them to contractors who then built the things. You can't have no right to sue them. And the argument is, if everybody could sue everybody in this case, it's going to get really, really messy. Let's just say only the direct purchasers get to sue. So if this holds by Illinois Brick, Apple's going to win. But this case isn't even about paying him yet. It's just about whether he has the legal right to sue. But this would affect Amazon. It would affect any internet business with a walled garden model. This could be a very, very large case. It just would probably take a while. There's Mr. Tim's in Tim's versus Indiana. And if you have been to my previews and reviews before, you know people get in trouble with cars. People do bad things in cars. People break the law in cars. People have burned out taillights in cars, as we will see later, that have a significant effect on a variety of things. The full name of the case, and my gosh, I love this, is Tyson Timms and a Land Rover LR2 versus the state of Indiana. There is a book full of cases like this from Indiana about repossessions, government things. My favorite one was, a black Cadillac and $100 versus the state of Indiana. <laughs> I'm not really quite sure how they're going to fight this out. I mean, they say money talks. So, you know, maybe the, maybe the money can be a lawyer also. So that's Mr. Tim's down there in the lower right. And this case is about civil forfeiture and excessive fines. Mr. Tim's was asking, dude, where's my car? Much like Action Kutcher was. Mr. Timms inherited money when his father died, and he used that money to buy a $42,000 Land Rover. Nice car, nice expensive car. And he used it to ferry heroin back and forth across Indiana. And so he pleads guilty to two felonies, and he gets a ridiculously good deal, in my opinion. He gets five years suspended, only has to serve one year in jail. That's not the problem. The problem comes because the state wants the car. The state says, you use this car in commission of crimes. And because we're not just taking it just to be mean, you used this particular car to transport heroin, which the government feels it has a community interest in not allowing heroin. That's why we're taking your car. And Tim said, well, the highest fine I could get in a case like this would be $10,000. You're taking a car that is worth way, even with the mileage I put on <clears throat> driving heroin across Indiana, it is still worth a lot more than $10,000. That violates the Eighth Amendment because you're taking a car that is much more valuable than what is considered to be a legitimate question. And here the big issue is what we call incorporation of the Bill of Rights. We last saw incorporation of the Bill of Rights in the McDonald versus Chicago case in which the Supreme Court said the Second Amendment applies to state and local governments. They ruled that a Chicago ordinance that was very restrictive of handguns was an unconstitutional violation of the Second Amendment. 
One of the very few parts of the Bill of Rights that never has been applied to the states is the Eighth Amendment Excessive Fines Clause. And a lot of states have just gone ahead and said, well, we've applied all the other stuff, let's apply the Excessive Fines Clause too. Actually, the Excessive Fines Clause, if you see somebody who's excessively fine, and that's just, it, it's illegal to be too smart and pantsome. So I stay here in the dark. So, the ex <laughs> that's the Excessively Fines Clause. It's very murky whether it applies to states and whether this particular incident is excessive. And it also fits into a much bigger controversy called the civil forfeitures controversy. One thing that often comes up in drug cases is the government will take houses, cars, boats, property prior to somebody being convicted of a crime. And some people say that's an unreasonable search and seizure. He's making a similar argument here, although in his case he's already been convicted. Okay, probably the saddest case of all the ones I'm going to look at is a death penalty case. There's a death penalty case pretty much all the time. And there's a case called Madison versus Alabama. Uh, those of you from Alabama know uh, Mobile down in the southern part. There's actually going to be two cases in a row about Mobile, Alabama. Uh, and this is about a man uh, named Madison who murdered the man in the lower part there. I always think in death penalty cases we should also talk about the victims just as in gun shootings we should also. Mr. Schulte had been a policeman investigating a missing child. And he came back to the house and found the child had been discovered and was back with his parents who were arguing because Mr. Madison down there in the lower corner was furious with his wife and threatening to hurt her because she had called the police. He said, Yo, what did you do that for? Why did you call the police? And the policeman basically said, calm down, everything's fine, no need to get agitated here. And he agreed out loud. What he then did was he went out the back of the house, found Schulte going back to his car, and shot him twice in the back of the head and murdered him. And that happened in 1985, when I was a senior in college. So you know this was a while ago. Um, so he shoots him in the back of the head. And his first conviction is overturned because of what is called a Batson challenge. You didn't know Batman had a child. Well, it's bat son. A Batson challenge comes from a case called Batson versus Kentucky about racially biased challenges of jurors. A common racist tactic used for many years was for a prosecutor to say, I'm not going to allow any black people on this jury that involves a black defendant, was what's called a preemptive challenge. And Batson versus Kentucky made that much more difficult. So the first conviction was overturned because the prosecutors had too much racial bias. The next one was overturned due to inadmissible evidence. It later was discovered the doctor who had examined him had been abusing narcotics at the time and is soon going to lose his doctor's license if those proceedings go through. So this isn't fair. So on the third try, they finally convict him. And what's significant about that is Alabama is the only state that allows for the death penalty to be carried out in a non-unanimous ruling. Normally, if you're sentenced to death in Texas, you need a unanimous ruling. Alabama says if you have no more than two dissenters, if it's 10 to 2, you can carry out an execution with a 10 to 2 jury vote. No other state, to my knowledge, in the country does that. Um, and what happened in his particular case was the, the jury sentenced him to eight, eight to four to life without parole. The judge overturned it. The judge said, I'm looking at the totality of this case. This guy deserves to die. I'm going to ignore the jury recommendation. Alabama no longer allows that. As I understand it, no state in the country allows a judge to do now what was done. But this is still governed by how they ruled in the law at the time. So this is a messy, messy, messy case. And the big issue is his mental state. There's a long set of rulings about the death penalty that concern mental state of the murder. Atkins versus Virginia started this long line of cases which said executing somebody of diminished mental capacity is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court said execution of somebody under 18, even in a spectacularly heinous crime, uh, the case of Roper versus Simmons, even that is excessive, is cruel and unusual punishment. So Mr. Madison's been in prison since 1985. He has since suffered two strokes. He now has dementia. 
He has many physical problems. And the physical problems mostly aren't an issue. The fact that his vision is bad, that he doesn't hear well, uh, he has various digestive problems, those aren't relevant. What is relevant is his diminished mental capacity. He no longer remembers the incident for which he is to be sentenced to die. He does understand he's to be sentenced to die, but he has no recollection. He has, his memory has been damaged severely by all of these strokes, and some people would say, well, you know, isn't that cruel and unusual punishment to execute somebody for something he doesn't even realize that he did? And the state of Alabama says what was cruel was the way he killed this person. Uh, Supreme Court turned it down before. Uh, this is gonna be another Eighth Amendment case. All right, and finally, cars speeding, the last of the uh, cases, also from Mobile, Alabama. And it's about a man named Terrence Gamble, who gambled on having an illegal gun and marijuana paraphernalia in his car and was pulled over for, what do people get pulled over for in these cases all the time? Burned out headlight. More cases come out of burned out, just for your sake, if you don't want to appear in the Supreme Court preview and review in the coming years, make sure all of your taillights are fully functional. So Mr. Gamble had a burned out taillight, police search his car, find an illegal gun. He had been convicted of a felony six years earlier, so he's not supposed to have a gun. And they found the marijuana paraphernalia, which if you've been following Jeff Sessions' career, there's a lot of conservatives in Alabama that take a rather conservative stance on the use of the evil weed. And so he served a year in, in state prison, but now the feds have him on another sentence for the exact same crime. And some people say, isn't that double jeopardy? You're not even charging with something, you're basically saying, well, we have laws against this, the state does, and we're going to get our shot at him too. And states vary as to whether they will allow this. There is now a strange coalition on the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas both think that states are violating double jeopardy in these cases. And they are very eager to take cases that will not let states sentence people for things they've already done federal crime for uh, or vice versa. So that's a double jeopardy case. And now forward into the past. Murphy versus NCAA, can states sponsor gambling on sports? And this dates back, as these things dribble in, to a law Congress passed in the early 1990s, which basically grandfathered in Nevada and other states that already had gambling. And it said, you guys have one year to decide if you want to have sports books in your state. And at that point, New Jersey said, nah, we'll pass. So then they're locked out. 20 years later, as its casinos are in some trouble, as its racetracks are in trouble, New Jersey says, hey, we've changed our mind. We want to have sports betting which is a multi-billion dollar business in Nevada and other places, and their state voted to allow sports gaming. The legislature passed enabling legislation, and the federal government said, uh-uh, can't do that. You had your chance in 1991. You are no longer eligible to legalize sports gambling. And New Jersey said, one, how come Nevada gets this and we don't? But their bigger argument was what is called commandeering, which happens when a state is mandated to carry out a federal law that the feds don't have the right to, dates back to a case about background checks for guns called U.S. versus Prince, where the Supreme Court said the government can't make a sheriff do background checks. So the NCAA and sports leagues fear gambling will taint the perception of their sport. We all know about the Black Sox scandal. You might not know how many scandals college basketball has had over what is called point shaving. You know, so if you get a really good shave, you get a couple points, and it's sponsored by Gillette. Point shaving is where you intentionally uh, do what gamblers ask you to to affect the point spread. You're not throwing the game, but say your team is favored by eight to win, and you still win, but you make sure you only win by three. Uh, the picture on the right is from a case from New England. There's a very famous point shaving scandal at Boston College, which eventually involved the Boston Mafia threatening to kill various players on the Boston College team who sometimes scored points when they weren't supposed to, which gave the Mafia a large sad. And when the Mafia is sad, they tend to lash out about their, their feelings. Now, so they say, we've got to protect against gambling. But three of the four major sports leagues, all, the th all, three, all four of the major sports leagues except the NFL, own a piece in either FanDuel or DraftKings. These are websites that allow you to essentially gamble on fantasy sports. They have daily payouts. 
So my opinion, the sports league's hands are really not entirely clean in saying, oh my goodness, gambling will, will wreck us all. And they're eh, looking a little sketchy. Supreme Court Rule 7-2 for New Jersey, they say this is commandeering uh, under the 10th Amendment. New Jersey is already running sports books at Monmouth Park. Note this is not gambling for everybody. You know, Tom and I can't set up our own little gambling operation. These are only a place states choose, and it's generally done to keep horse racing and casinos alive. So it isn't like, you know, the Mount Vernon Country Store is going to be having this. Although some states do have sports gambling in terms of the state lottery. But it's a very limited kind of thing. A lot of states are working on this, and some people ask, well, what if you have a state that doesn't want to make marijuana illegal? Is that commandeering if the feds try and limit what they can do on those issues? Big federalism questions coming out of this case. Carpenter versus United States is a towering matter about cell phones. Uh, you may recall from last year, this was about a string of robberies in Detroit by a group, by a group of, it was like 15 men, had a large ring where they would rob Radio Shacks and uh, other stores uh, order the people into the back with a gun, using a gun as a key part of this case, because now we're in federal law. That's why it's not a purely Michigan case. Use a gun in a robbery, you're talking federal case now. And they thought, well, gee, these guys know about cell phones. I bet we can find them with their cell phones. You may not realize when you carry a cell phone that your cell phone as you travel is pinging off lots of towers. And that can be identified where you are at on these kinds of things. And there's a law that was passed in 1986, back when almost nobody had a cell phone, called the Stored Communications Act. And so the police can get access to information that phone companies are willing to give them. So in this case, they went to Verizon. And they had to go get an approval from a judge, but a much easier standard than a normal warrant. Don't have to prove probable cause but you still have to get some approval. They got the approval, and they found that sure enough, uh, Mr. Sanders and Mr. Carpenter were within two miles of the robbery sites at each and every case of the robberies. And so the question then becomes, is this an unreasonable search and seizure? Well, first off, Carpenter thinks 116 years is unreasonable. That doesn't go anywhere. What does get to be an issue is what is called the third party doctrine. You go to one on Thursday and Friday, maybe you want to go to one on Saturday, that would be the third. Third party doctrine says it's legal for a third party to give the government information in a criminal case. So for example, your bank records, the argument is you let the bank have information about your bank records. Or you let the phone company know how long you were calling. Back in my day, you got charged for long distance on what time of day you called, how long the call was, where you were calling. And so the argument was, well, a third party can give that stuff to the police, and that's not protected by the Fourth Amendment, and that's pretty much standard precedent. The other piece that supports that idea is what is called the envelope theory. The envelope theory says the police can look at the outside of an envelope. They can't, if they want to tear the envelope open and look and see what's inside, now you need a warrant. But if it's just, when was this postmarked? Who was this addressed to? What was the return address? You don't need that warrant, but to look inside you do. So the police are saying in this case, hey, we did everything the law demanded. This is not a case where the police misbehaved. The police did absolutely everything the law said they had to do. And they said, we weren't listening to what they were saying. We didn't surveil anything. There is no violation of privacy. We have no idea what they said. All we know is who got called when, and you've always allowed that. And if you go by current precedent, this evidence is going to get used, and these guys are going to get convicted. But some people would say, well, maybe this is different. Not many people had a cell phone in 1986. They were mostly what were called trunked phones, that you had like a cord from your trunk to some giant box. You weren't carrying it everywhere. It couldn't be used nearly as much to find out where you are, which is called geolocation. That's if you can't find your Chevy Geo in a parking lot, you start trying some geolocation. And there have been some rulings lately that have said there should be some limits on what the police can do in terms of uh, geolocation. Uh, for example, uh, the police in Washington, D.C. 
uh, tracked a man they suspected being a drug dealer. They left the GPS tracker on his car three times longer than the warrant said they were allowed to, found that he had a massive heroin operation, and his conviction was thrown out said, no, you know too much about somebody because now you know where somebody's been for days and days and days. And this all comes under a ruling called Cats versus United States. It's a case people have fought over like cats and dogs. Okay. What's, anybody know what Cats is? Cats is a case involving a bookie in Los Angeles using a phone booth to call Miami and New York. And he argued, well, I was in a phone booth. I should have expected more privacy from the police. And Katz establishes the idea that how much privacy you can expect from government depends on where you are. If you are at home, you can have a reasonable expectation. It's going to be a very high bar for the government to find out what you're doing. On the other hand, if you're walking down the street and you're not concealed by anything, you have a very low expectation of privacy. And we'll see, Clarence Thomas doesn't like this idea. I was a little surprised by this, but the court rules for Carpenter. They throw out the cell phone evidence. Roberts joins the four liberals. And this is what we're going to see in the future. The swing vote is now going to be John Roberts on the Supreme Court. He's going to take that Kennedy role. We're already starting to see some cases with this. It's a win for something called mosaic theory. Mosaic theory in these cases says, if you search something once, Maybe that isn't violated, but if you've got everybody's data over months and months and months, and you add this piece to this piece to this piece to this piece, then government knows too much about where you've been and what you're doing, and at that point, it becomes intrusive. So in this case, they said, we, you've got months and months of data where you knew exactly where these men were every hour of the day. That goes too far in a way that it wouldn't if it was a shorter term period, and that's where the mosaic theory comes in. Uh, the Riley versus California case about cell phones said, a cell phone is almost a feature of human anatomy. And this is what Robert said, people carry their phones with them, unless you're like me and you have a beat up old track phone that you have in your car in case you run into a moose or you can't remember if you were supposed to buy milk. But most people carry phones with them, so you know where people are at almost all the time. And so, uh, the, and the Jones case is the one I talked about earlier. Thomas wants to neuter cats, just like Bob Barker. He's the Bob Barker of the cat's decision. Thomas says, where do you get this reasonable expectation of pride? I don't see that anywhere in the Constitution. I don't think there is such a thing as a reasonable. Thomas was really annoyed at this particular ruling. He said, what zone of privacy? You have no zone of privacy. There is no zone. Thomas, if you, when you want to find the person who's got the most extreme and interesting take on issues, Thomas is a good place to look. Uh, now we come to a masterpiece. People fight at weddings. Bad things happen at weddings periodically. Uh, people argue. When I was a kid, I sometimes wondered, what it would it be like to go to somebody's wedding and object to people? I, I object. <laughs> He's horrible. Well, there was a lot of fighting about this particular case. It involved a man named Jack Phillips, who you see down there, owner of Masterpiece Cake, and two men who had gone to New Jersey to get married at a time when Colorado did not have legal same-sex marriage. And they came back to Colorado, wanted a custom cake to celebrate their wedding. And Mr. Phillips said, no. I'll sell you other, well, he said later, I would have sold them any cake in the store. I'm not discriminating against them because they're gay. What I won't do is make a cake that violates my own principles. I wouldn't make a case attacking gay people. I wouldn't make a cake that celebrated Nazis. Uh, he's one of those conservative Christians that thinks Halloween is, you know, inspired by the devil. He says, I wouldn't make a Halloween cake. I wouldn't make any of these things. And if the government is telling me I have to do that, the government is compelling speech. And as we've seen a lot in recent Supreme Court rulings, the Supreme Court does not like compelled speech. And if you're a liberal that doesn't like that argument, think back to the Jehovah's Witness cases of the 1940s, where the Supreme Court said schools cannot make people with a religious objection stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. He's arguing this is the same thing with me. If government says I have to say something. That should be treated the same way as those Pledge of Allegiance cases were. The state of Colorado, on the other hand, had a non-discrimination statute that said, you're refusing service on the basis of sexual orientation. That's flat out illegal. You can't do that. We don't see this as speech. 
We see this as refusal of service, and that's covered by a lot of civil rights laws. So people thought this was gonna be a major ruling over LGBT rights versus religious rights and freedom of speech. But when the Supreme Court can issue a ruling that's more narrowly tailored, they almost always, always, always will do it, and that's exactly what they did. They took the narrowest possible little, have you ever gone to a place and said, I just like a sliver of cake? This is what the Supreme Court does. They say, we're not gonna judge whether his freedom of speech was violated. We're going to say the Civil Rights Commission said a bunch of really inappropriate, anti-religious things, and we're gonna rule on that basis that they had a religious animus against this man. We're not making a broad statement. They argued that it was a bad vehicle. There's a vehicle problem, like this woman that's got an overheated car. Meaning, the facts of this case are not right for settling this bigger issue. We're only gonna settle this on a narrow one, and what the courts will do in a case like that is say, bring us another case that fits the, what we're trying to do better. So this isn't going away, but it wasn't the definitive answer a lot of people thought. There's already a lawsuit from a woman in Washington State who's a florist, who I would argue has a much poorer case about freedom of speech than somebody who's making a cake. Would this apply to a limo driver? Could a limo driver say, I have an objection? Where do you draw the line? I think a cake baker's got a better, because that's an artistic process, has a better argument than a florist, a limousine driver, a caterer, those kinds of things. But we don't really know where this is gonna go. All right, well, we know where this one went. This was the uh, ruling that took a big swing at public employee unions, overturned a 41-year-old precedent involving this man, a man named Abood, who was a teacher in, David Abood was a teacher in Detroit, and he said, I don't like the teacher's union. I don't want to have to be in a union. I don't want to have to pay anything. I want nothing to do with the union, but you've got a collective bargaining agreement with me, and you are making me join the union. And the Supreme Court, as they did so often in the Burger years, came up with a compromise. And what the compromise said was, you can't make somebody join a union, and you can't make people pay for the political stuff a union does. But given that unions are legally obligated to represent everybody in their collective bargaining agreement, are working to get them better pay, they have to represent them in a range of things, it is fair for a union to charge what's called a fair share fee that we'll let you off the hook on these other things, but you still have to pay something to prevent what's called the free rider problem. Supreme Court, as expected, rules five to four for Mr. Janus, who worked in um, child protection in the state of Illinois, didn't like the unions. A lot of conservative groups like the Koch brothers have been looking for a ruling like this for a long time to put some damage on uh, public employee unions. Uh, big loss for uh, labor unions who will find it harder to get people to be members. And if you're becoming impatient and squirrely, the end is near. And we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So we're gonna talk about the South Dakota versus Wayfair case. Now, I was surprised when I brought this up the students didn't know Wayfair very well. Old people like me that own houses with furniture all know about Wayfair. And Wayfair has become a very large employer in the state of Maine. They operate multiple call centers in the state of Maine. Uh, they have one in Brunswick, I think they have one in Brewer. Wayfair is now the largest online retail of furniture in the United States. They sell lamps, couches, other furniture, but they are not based in South Dakota and they don't have stores. And this has become a huge problem as the internet has gotten bigger. Is this fair to the brick and mortar stores? I live in Augusta. We have something that is called the Turnpike Mall, in quotation marks which now has, I think, three stores are left inside the mall. Sears is in deep trouble, they've closed a lot of things. Brick and mortar retail in a physical site is in trouble in part because Wayfair and Overstock.com and other sites have a massive advantage over them because companies like this have been held to be ineligible to charge state sales taxes unless they have a physical presence in the state. So if you buy something from Kmart.com, and Kmart has a store in Augusta. They've got a store in various places in Maine. Kmart has to charge you sales tax for that because they have a physical presence in Maine. Kmart's headquarters is now in Illinois since they moved in with Sears. Illinois has to charge you that. Wayfair only has to charge sales tax on things in states where they have a physical presence. And that's a massive advantage, some people would say an unfair advantage, to traditional go-to-the-store 
retailers. And all the precedent is totally on Wayfair's side. I had never heard of National Bellis Hess before. But they were apparently one of the big, big catalog retailers for about 60 or 70 years in the United States until the 70s. And they had mail order. Uh, they were based in Kansas City. Illinois said, we want to charge tax on the stuff you're selling in Illinois. National Bellis Hess says, we don't operate in Illinois. We don't have a store in Illinois. We don't have anybody in Illinois. We just send stuff from Kansas City to people in Illinois. Don't make us have to charge Illinois sales tax. And the Supreme Court agreed with them and saw this as a case involving what we call the Hidden Commerce Clause, which is that only the national government can regulate interstate commerce. Illinois is messing with interstate commerce by charging a tax. So they're violating the Constitution. Similar case comes up in Quill. Here you see Quill is standing. Keep an eye on that Quill. The Quill is standing in this particular case. Quill is an office retailer. They didn't have stores in North Dakota. North Dakota said, well, there's these new things called floppy disks that you mail to customers. The floppy disks are a physical presence. <laughs> these little tiny plastic wedges. Supreme Court said, that ain't a physical presence. That is so not a physical presence. Well, there's a little more online retailing now than there was in 1992, isn't there? Lot more stuff. So, Uh-oh, what happened to the quill? Quill has been knocked down. Quill has been overturned. Quill has run out of ink. Supreme Court said, in one of Kennedy's last opinions, he's saying quill, the quill ruling created an unfair advantage for online retailers. And that this has really harmed states and it's harmed brick and mortar retailers. We say South Dakota does have the right to charge these taxes. And right now there's a, there's a large number of states, several dozen states, are beginning to look at how they can tax these. Now a few companies like Amazon chose to collect the taxes, but most of them didn't. Robert says, well, we should not mess with e-commerce, let e-commerce run. And sometimes the coalitions are funny. So you have Kennedy kind of conservative, Thomas, really conservative, Gorsuch and Alito, very conservative, and the notorious RBG, who is every liberal. There is now an RBG doll that was funded by crowdfunding. You can get a Ruth Bader Ginsburg action figure for your home. She joined the conservatives. So it's important to understand not every case breaks down on all the liberals are over here and all the conservatives are over here. Um, and she might have even signed that opinion with a quill pen. I always end the talk with this. This is my all-time favorite picture of the Supreme Court. I use this to end every year. That is Justice Stephen Breyer on a reading day dressed as the cat in the hat reading, Oh, the places you will go. There is no other picture, I think, that does a better job of summing up stories about the Supreme Court than that one, and there's my contact information. So we've got about 10 minutes. I'd be more than happy to field any questions that you have. Who's got a question? Jonathan Cohen's not here. He's always the guy that asks me stuff. Anybody? Mr. Donahue. Case. Yeah. Does that pertain just to geolocation, or is that um, searching, uh, searching without a warrant broadly? Uh, just to geolocation. And even in the prior status, they still had to get judicial approval, but a judicial approval that had an easier standard to meet than a traditional warrant. So it doesn't affect, say, police warrants knocking on your door. It's only about geolocation. And the argument is cell phone companies now have such a wide range of information where you are that because that's so intrusive and they know so much about where you're at, that because of that, following the mosaic theory, that makes it different. But it really doesn't affect anything where you don't know about geolocation. It's a huge defeat, though, for the third party doctrine. Because you know, they were saying, look, Verizon gave us this information. Verizon, you willingly gave your location away to Verizon. And the argument the court made is that you're not really thinking that when you're carrying your cell phone around. That's too broad a view of it. No, it doesn't affect any other warrants. Do we need a search warrant to, to look at the contents of someone's computer? Mm -hmm. But could they bypass that and go to Google to find the searches, mm -hmm. the downloads. It's a good question. 
that Riley case I brought up dealt with some of those. Riley was a man who had been pulled over in California, and the police said, well, it brought up something called incident to arrest. The police can do searches to people largely to protect their physical safety. Like, if I'm arresting you as a policeman, I would like to know if you're armed or not. This is where the Terry Frisks come in from Terry versus Ohio. And they said, well, the cell, we have the right to search anything. We're going to take your cell phone and we're going to take it back to the police station and search it. And the court said that's an unreasonable search and seizure because the phone was not involved in anybody's physical safety at this point. This is not a gun or a knife or a syringe or anything that could be used. So the personal safety piece is a large part of that as well. Um, and that was where they came up with that idea that the cell phone is almost a part of the body. And the argument is cell phones are different now than they were back in the day. If you had, say, you knew somebody made a phone call from a pay phone. We used to have these things called pay phones that you could pay to use a phone. Okay? And that would only give you one location, but now you've multiplied this to thousands and thousands and thousands of locations. It's a good example of how as technology changes, the way we look at the Fourth Amendment is going to change also. Okay. Does that answer your question, more or less? Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir? What's your gut hunch about where the Kavanaugh mess is going? Wow. Um, that's a tough question. My hunch is this is going to, first off, we know there won't be the vote that was scheduled for Monday. It's going to drag out. I, I, boy, I really don't know. I would have said three days ago he was definitely going to get in. I really didn't think the Democrats had the votes. There are too many Democrats like Joe Donnelly uh, from conservative states, Heidi Heitkamp. I really think Susan Collins was ready to vote for him. She seemed very convinced by his answers to a range of things. Three days ago, I'd say he's totally on the court. I don't know where it's going. I really don't. If I had to go one way or another, I would guess that a lot of Republicans want him on so badly before the elections that they will still vote to confirm if they don't think the evidence is convincing. But if they wait for an FBI investigation, this could drag out till after control. But the other thing I'll say is a lot of people that want to get rid of Kavanaugh aren't really thinking who else Trump would nominate. They say, we want to get rid of Kavanaugh. He's this guy who's opposed to Roe versus Wade. He's so concerned. And a lot of the work, the Be a Hero campaign that's being used uh, to try and persuade Susan Con Donald Trump is not going to appoint somebody those people like any better. The person he's almost certainly going to appoint is a woman named Amy Coney, Bar Amy Coney Barrett, who is a very, 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 very conservative professor of law at Notre Dame who was well, a lot of the really true believer conservatives wanted him to a point. Trump is going to get somebody who's going to vote to overturn Ro Roe versus Wade. That's what I'm more certain of. I really don't think blocking Kavanaugh is going to stop that from happening, but whether he specifically will be the guy or it'll be somebody like the law professor from Notre Dame, 5149, 51 for Kavanaugh. That'd be my guess. And those of you watching on television can all laugh at me if I get this all wrong. Other questions? Yes, sir. That's slightly like related. I've heard growing chatter about Kavanaugh's uh, beliefs on the executive power. Yeah. How do you think that's going to play out with Supreme Court, especially in light of how they've been in the past? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. A lot of Kavanaugh's background is work in the executive branch. He worked for George W. Bush. Uh, he worked with the Ken Starr investigation. He has an extremely expansive view of presidential power, particularly about presidential indictments. And some people think that's another reason why Trump appointed him. Trump administration has had an unprecedented number of prosecutions of campaign officials, prosecutions of other people. And so that, I think, is one of the things that people looking for cover to vote against him could use. As opposed to saying, I'm not voting just on abortion, but I'm really troubled by his view on executive power. I think his path to confirmation would have been much easier if he hadn't said the things he did about expansive, uh, expansive power. I think that would have been an easier out for people that wanted to vote against him. Uh, so I think that could be a problem for him too. But minus the allegations, I think he had the votes. Anyone else? Oh, back to the dusky gopher frog, yes. That's coming up. That has not been ruled on. Yeah, so the issue with that is um, you're trying to protect an extremely... There are fewer than 200 of them in the world. 
And they all live in one of three pond areas in southern Mississippi. They used to be in Louisiana, Mississippi, and southwestern Alabama, which we keep coming back to Mobile somehow. And so, yeah. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the question is, is it, is it a legitimate use of the Commerce Clause power of the national government? My question is, if Kavanaugh gets appointed, yeah. doesn't he have a history of voting against regulations? Like, he doesn't yes. like regulations yes. kind of period? Yes. Yes, he does. So, um, Though I think they wouldn't even need him to change. I... I think this might be, I don't know if they'll go all the way to getting rid of Chevron deference, but I think the Supreme Court's likely to rule in favor of the landholders in this case. Okay. And, so and again, I anybody else Trump would appoint would vote the same way. Question that, similar question. Yes. There's so many other things like on the environment and mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. he's totally like lined up with that's in the boss. No. Yeah. yeah, he is. I'm wondering why people are so well, look at the time. Um, <laughs> because Roe versus Wade has been something people have looked at for a long time, a lot of groups on both sides of the question. I think a lot of it is that Roe versus Wade seems like such a clean, you're for it or not. An environmental thing. Say we're looking at the dusky gopher frog, which I had never done until about a couple weeks ago. Okay, there's various ways you can frame that. Well, I'd be fine with it being preserved, but it has to be in place. There's a lot of ranges of gray. And the way we as a country have debated abortion has tended to be very dichotomous. It's all, you're on the good guy's side or the bad guy's side. No matter what side of it you're on, people tend to look at the other side as the enemy more than any other issue in American politics. It seems to be very difficult for people to compromise. The other piece of it is there are interest groups like NARAL, like Planned Parenthood, and for that matter, the pro-life organizations that did. And the clearest thing Donald Trump said in the campaign about the judges he would appoint was he said over and over and over and over, I'm going to appoint a judge who will overturn Roe versus Wade. This should not be a surprise to anybody that he's appointing somebody people think will do that. Nobody was asking, are you going to appoint judges that have this view on labor relations or the environment? Nobody asked about those things. But it's become a polarizing issue in presidential elections, and I think that's a lot of why the focus is so much there. That, and it's the one where you know this could flip the switch. Because Kennedy was a consistent vote for abortion rights on the court, and whoever Trump appoints, whoever Trump appoints, won't be. And so I'm, I would question in some ways the strategy of saying, well, block Kavanaugh and all our problems. They're not going to go away. There will be a conservative justice on the court sooner or later, even if the Democrats take the Senate, which I don't think they're going to be able to do. I, don't think, I think the Democrats are going to take the House. They will not take the Senate. And you're still going to get one of these. But that would be my take as to why Roe is so. And it gets into such personal things, you know, people's sexuality, people's bodies, the nature of life, the nature of community. Is this an example of violence in society? I mean, there's just so many different ways that abortion comes up that it pushes people's buttons in a way the environment doesn't. And I think people get angrier at the, uh, people are more likely to see their opponents on abortion as evil. And I think that's true of both sides of the question. Then on an environment, you can say, well, we could finesse this this way. Or you can look at a case like Carpenter, and I say, okay, I, I can see both sides of Carpenter. I would have ruled for the US. But I totally get why somebody would say, this is all there, but abortion, it's just so hard to find that middle ground on. And I think that's in part because both interest groups on both sides have an interest in making it as polarizing an issue as possible. And you know, a lot of groups do this. You know, interest groups largely get their money by scaring the bejabbers out of you about what the other side is going to do. You know, save us from these people. And I think no issue's been more that way than abortion. Can you say that there was a precedent overturned that was a 41-year-old precedent? Yep, the Abood precedent on public employee unions, yes. Precedents get overturned. Right, so the fact that Kavanaugh would say, oh, I respect that it was a precedent set, hmm. it's almost like a nonsense well, it wasn't a nonsense statement when he said it. When did he say it? He said it when he was on the D.C. Circuit. 
when you're on the D, and granted, it's the most powerful appellate court in the country short of the Supreme Court, but your job on that court is not to create new precedent. Your job on that court is to largely obey the precedents that are in place. It was not a nonsensical thing for him to say then. But he said it to the Oh, that's what Susan is reporting. That would be more problematic. But what was really quoted of, the one that everybody's talking about, is what he said on the DC Circuit, because he said that in an actual case. And so I would say it's partly a matter, he said it was a matter of settled law, is, was the direct quote he had to Collins, but Plessy versus Ferguson was settled law. We overturned that. Lots of things that were considered settled law at one point, people can look at. Precedents can always be overturned if people come with enough reason. But I do have one precedent that I need to stop at one o'clock. And so uh, thank you all very much for coming, and we'll be doing this again next year.